Welcome everybody. This is our ninth organization of biological field stations live from the field event. My name is Carrie Winninger with Sonoma State University's Center for Environmental Inquiry. We encourage you to view past recordings and learn more at thevirtualfield.org. For those of you who are instructors, please be sure to visit thevirtualfield.org to access supplementary materials for your students, such as an instructor guide for Live from the Field events with suggested assignments and an event resources document full of publications about the specific research topics and projects being discussed today. Very quickly, here are some guidelines for this webinar. All participants are muted and your video cameras are off. During the presentation, please use the chat button to communicate with us and each other, remembering to choose all panelists and attendees so everyone will see your comments. Please submit your questions for the researchers to answer live using the Q&A button, not the chat. And this button may be not as familiar to you, so try and find it now and message me if you can't find it. If you are here as part of a college class, please type the word student in front of your question so we can prioritize it. And it's important to make sure your full name is visible so you receive credit for attending today. If your Zoom username is different, uh, then type your full name before your question. Also welcome if you are watching us streaming live on Facebook, we'll try and get to your questions too. Without further ado, I will turn this over to Dr. Patty Saunders, an Associate Professor of Biology at Ashland University. Patty is an aquatic ecologist and Director of Environmental Preserves on behalf of AU's Environmental Science Program, which she directs. Patty has approximately 30 years of experience working at field sites, and we are very fortunate to have her moderating this event today. Thank you all for joining live from the field. Um, we welcome classes, faculty, and other participants from across the nation and around the world. In this series, we're going to take you on virtual field trips to research sites around the country and the world. As you'll see today, we are visiting three biological field stations and marine labs, places where people from many backgrounds come together to study the environment. Live from the Field events are a project of the Virtual Field, an international coalition of over 50 field stations and marine labs. This National Science Foundation funded effort brings the field to you. Find out more about events like this and other virtual learning experiences for college students at thevirtualfield.org. Today, we will get a snapshot into the work of three scientists doing research and field work to address the impacts of invasive species in aquatic ecosystems. Uh, these three videos will share the perspectives of scientists doing field research, meaning they work on scientific questions directly in the context of natural systems. We'll see examples of research in wetlands, lakes, and a marine coastal ecosystem. These include a community-based science approach to management of invasive green crabs in an intertidal sand flat, how field-based research helps with making plans for reducing the spread of invasive species in Ontario lakes, and how invasive plants may be reducing habitat availability for wetland specialist birds called rails. I'm excited to moderate this session of Live from the Field and introduce you to some examples of how science and field research of freshwater invasions can inform land management and conservation biology. Hopefully this panel will stimulate your questions and ideas. Each researcher has prepared an eight minute video describing their research. After the videos, they'll be available to answer your questions live. I encourage everyone to post your questions in the Q&A as we go along. You don't have to wait until the panel discussion after the videos. Okay, the Bodega Marine Lab sits on the Bodega Marine Reserve, a 616 acre reserve located in West Sonoma County in Northern California. It contributes to the understanding and wise stewardship of the earth and its natural systems by supporting university level teaching, research and public service. 
Bodega Marine Reserve would like to acknowledge, honor, and make visible that these lands are the ancestral lands of Native peoples. The researcher you'll hear from first is Ted Grossholtz, a professor and specialist in cooperative extension with University of California, Davis. Ted earned his PhD in zoology and studies the impacts of biological invasions and climate change in coastal ecosystems. He has been working at Bodega Marine Lab for 25 years. He likes learning about the natural world and documenting how human activities are changing these systems. And today we'll be telling you about his research on invasive green crabs. Hi everybody, uh, I'm Ted Grossholtz. I'm a professor and cooperative extension specialist at the University of California, Davis and the Bodega Marine Laboratory. This behind me is the reserve of the Bodega Marine Lab. So it's a wonderful place to do work and I'll talk about that in a second. So I'm a professor and cooperative extension specialist. And as a professor, that means I teach undergraduate classes on campus, I mentor grad students, I conduct research, which I'll talk about. And I also am a cooperative extension specialist, which means that I work off campus to solve problems that uh, regarding things like uh, climate change and invasive species, coastal issues that I can conduct workshops and, and try to provide solutions for. So I got started in this not really as an ecologist, but I was really an environmental studies major in, uh, in college and only really towards the end did I sort of discover ecology and biology through uh, my mentor, Dr. Mark Burtness. So you don't have to be sort of a, a dyed in the wool uh, scientist at a young age. You can come into this at a much later point. So um, what I'd like to do now is to sort of tell you a little bit about um, the kind of work that we're doing out here. And I want to sort of start with the question, what happened here? In the 1990s, a species called the European green crab, which I'll show you right here, got established in Bodega Harbor here. So if you can move in just a little bit, you can see this little crab here. Um, they can be a good bit bigger, but these crabs are the only predator in this large intertidal sand flat area. Na the native crabs aren't common in this area. So they have this whole wide open area to, uh, to be a predator in. And one of the things that they consume are things like this. There's clams, uh, smaller things like small clams, we have amphipods, small polychaete worms, you can see the bigger clams here. But this is the food web that supports shorebirds, which we'll see over here if you just pan over to this side. You can see them flying in the distance. Okay, and then back. So this is an important food web and, and that involves a group of like 12 different birds, some of which are threatened and endangered like snowy plovers. So it's a very important habitat here. And my question was, what's the impact of green crabs in this area? So I used a number of methods and techniques with colleagues. So we use traps like this to census the green crabs, exclosures or enclosures to actually keep green crabs away from specific areas or groups of invertebrates to experimentally quantify the impacts of green crabs. And we use surveys, uh, you know, binocular spotting scopes at different ports of the bay, different portions of the bay, different, uh, different times of year to get an understanding of the abundance of shorebirds and how that changes over time. So our results were actually very, very conclusive. And I wanted to add one other thing. We also conducted some large field experiments with a grad student who was a shorebird expert that involved four meter wide uh, arenas in which we would allow green crabs in to forage for a few days or not as controls and then put shorebirds in for a number of hours and mount, monitor their feeding and weight gain. So it was a very dramatic effect of green crabs, both experimentally on the shorebirds, but also distributionally. We were able to monitor and determine that the shorebirds were changing their distribution as a result of where green crabs were, were foraging. So um, we were able to easily document the green crab impacts. But then the question was, what do we do about this? Is there a way we can mitigate green crab impacts in these habitats? And so one of the things that we did was to identify an area called uh, Sea Drift Lagoon, which was an area a little bit distant from here 
that had, was somewhat closed off, so it didn't have a lot of connection to other bays, which allowed us to go in and see if we could remove all the green crabs from a specific area. So this was an opportunity to try methods like this. So we put a lot of traps in with a lot of people to see if we could get rid of and eradicate all the green crabs from this habitat. So what we're able to do is over a five year period, we fish down the green crabs, we remove them down to about 10% of what the original population was. So we were feeling very good about ourselves and until the next year we came back out and there were more green crabs than we started with. So we got this enormous explosion, this sort of enormous population rebound as a result of this, uh, these, uh, this sort of theory predicted, this, this sort of response of, of populations to removal. So theoretical models suggested this could happen. This was the first time anyone had ever really seen something like this, but it meant we had to go back to the drawing board. So is biology, is science a linear process? Absolutely not. We found once again that our expectations were different than what we found. Often science is such that you get a counterintuitive result, you get something not what you expected, then you have to go back to the drawing board and come up with new questions and new approaches. And we had to do exactly the same thing. So what we had to do was stop trying to eradicate the species. But what we did was decide to keep the population at a low level. So instead of fishing it down to 10% and getting a rebound, fishing it, keeping it about 30% so that we could get some of the ecosystem functions, some of the native species coming back into the system. Um, but we'd have to maintain that level for some period of time. The way we approached that was to use citizen science and community science volunteers to help us maintain that population at that lower level for a long period of time. And so the, this approach, this community science uh, was, was very effective. So we brought in a lot of local people, landowners, people that were really interested in this habitat to help us maintain that reduced level, that suppression level of green crabs. And that's been very effective. We've been doing that for the last five or six years. So uh, we learned a lot. We had to completely redo what we were doing, but our, our current um, approach has been very effective. What I'd like to suggest is that um, this approach, the, um, the citizen and community science uh, volunteer program is a wonderful way for undergrads to get involved. So if you're interested in trying to get involved in community science or, or science generally, there are a number of programs uh, on the West Coast. For instance, there's Beach Watch, there's Reef Check, which is actually an international program that involves large numbers of volunteers. And so if you're thinking about how do I get involved in something like this, that's a great opportunity and a great way to try to do that. So I would strongly suggest that if you're interested in trying to get uh, experience in field science in these coastal habitats, that tr contacting a citizen or community science program and making yourself available as a volunteer is, is a great way to do that. So um, I think what I'll do is I'll stop now, but I do want to encourage people to try to contact me if they're interested, if they have any follow-up questions, please read the papers that we put on the website and um, I'd be happy to answer questions and follow up with emails. So thanks very much and see you, see you at another point. Seventy-six years, the Queen's University Biological Station has provided a dynamic and supportive environment for leading edge research and teaching in biology and related sciences on seven, more than 7,000 acres in the Frontenac Arch Biosphere, Ontario. They also offer public outreach and educational programs in biodiversity conservation and environmental stewardship at their Elbow Lake Environmental Education Center campus. Queen's University Biological Station is situated on traditional Haudenosaunee territory and unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. They are grateful to be able to live and learn on these lands. Next, we'll hear from Shelley Arnott, a professor at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. She has been working at Queen's University Biological Station for 19 years and uses a combination of field surveys, field experiments, and laboratory studies to provide science in support of environmental policy and management. One thing she likes about field research is working in natural settings to understand ecological systems 
and providing the next generations of scientists tools for addressing current environmental challenges. Today, we'll hear from her about investigating how aquatic communities respond and adapt to regional disturbances, including invasive species, calcium decline, and climate change, and what actions can be taken to reduce human-mediated spread. My name is Shelley Arnott, and I'm a professor in biology at Queen's University in Kingston, Canada. My research is understanding how aquatic communities respond to environmental pollutants and climate change. I didn't really have a direct path to my current career. Instead, it happened because of a combination of serendipity and taking advantage of important opportunities as they arose. When I finished my undergrad in chemistry and biology, I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I, I took a year off and I traveled through China, the Middle East, and Africa. And it was actually on the Yangtze River um, in the three gorge, floating along the three gorges that I decided that I wanted to do a master's. And I had a really great experience in, my, in my, doing my master's research because my supervisor gave me the freedom to ask the questions I want and to explore different ways of answering them. From there, I did a, a PhD thinking that I wanted to be a government scientist. And instead, I ended up getting a one-year position teaching. And from that, I realized that I couldn't be the researcher that I wanted to be unless I was being challenged and pushed by students who questioned me and the existing paradigms. So then I went to a small teaching university in Northern Ontario. And again, a new opportunity came up and I ended up at Queen's, which was a better fit for me. One of the things I love about my job is that I have the opportunity to work with amazing undergraduate and graduate students who are conducting research on, on aquatic communities. I spend about 40% of my time teaching various courses, which includes a field course at the Queen's University Biological Station. I also teach an aquatic ecology course, an invasive species seminar, and a graduate stats course. I spend about 40% of my time doing research, and this involves supervising or mentoring graduate and undergraduate students who are pursuing questions related to both the fundamental ecology of aquatic systems, as well as more applied issues like invasive species. The remainder of my job consists of, of service to both the university and the science, the broader science field. This includes things like being chair of a equity, diversity, inclusion, and indigeneity committee. I'm an associate director of the Queen's University Biological Station, and I serve on various committees that deal with um, tenure and promotion of my, of my colleagues. Understanding how invasive species impact aquatic communities has been a central focus of my research over the past several decades. Initially, we were very interested in the impact that uh, non-native species had on uh, freshwater communities. And more recently, we've been shifting gears to try to understand what factors influence the spread of, of non-native species from lake to lake. Understanding how invasive species impact communities has been a central aim of my work. Initially, we were focused on understanding their impact on zooplankton and phytoplankton communities, but more recently, we've been interested in understanding factors that drive their establishment as they move from lake to lake. And because humans are a primary vector um, that move zooplankton or that move non-native species from, from place to place, we've been doing studies to test decontamination strategies that boaters can use. We use a variety of approaches to understand how aquatic communities, primary, primarily plankton, respond to individual and combined stressors. We do lake surveys to investigate community composition across environmental gradients. We do some modeling to test our ideas and predict future scenarios. And we conduct laboratory and field experiments. Our forte is field experiments, and a lot of our work is done using in lake mesocosms or land-based tanks that range in size from 200 liters to 800 liters. In these experiments, we can manipulate one or more factors and test how the plankton communities are responding to them. 
With our work on invasive species, we found that both the number and the frequency of individuals arriving at a particular site can influence their likelihood of establishing there. In freshwater systems, boats and fishing equipment can be important vectors that move non-native species from site to site. So what this means is that anything we can do to, to reduce the number of individuals or species in or on boats that are moved between lakes will help prevent the spread of non-native species. We're continuing to ask questions about invasive species and are interested in how they interact with other stressors. For example, if a non-native species arrives in a lake that's experiencing increased nutrients, is the combined effect of those two stressors greater, less, or the same as the individual effects? And we're using mesocosm studies to address these questions. A lot of the time we identify problems through observations. My lab works closely with the Ontario Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, and they've been collecting long-term data for, on seven lakes for over 40 years. So using these data, we're able to identify changes in the lakes. For example, increases in salinity due to winter road salt application changes in nutrients or the arrival of non-native species. We then design experiments to identify and quantify cause and effect relationships. Research is definitely not a linear process. I think of it more of, a, of an iterative process where we ask a question, we get an answer, and usually we get many more questions. So we design more studies or more experiments to attempt to answer those questions. And so really the, the progress that we make in science is through a combination of, of multiple efforts using different approaches, different, different team members, all working towards the same goal of better understanding how environmental change influences aquatic systems. So for example, with our invasive species work, we've done lake surveys to understand how um, a, an invasive predator, Bithotrephes, influences primary and secondary production in, in lakes. But we've also done mesocosm studies to look at predation rates and to see how native predators interact with those non-native predators. We've done small scale uh, experiments in bottles to try to, um, to you know, pinpoint rates, uh, feeding rates under different environments. and. We've done large scale collaborative projects where, where we do similar experiments across multiple sites to try to see whether we can generalize our results. So our research is really uh, a combination of efforts of a whole bunch of different people and a whole bunch of different studies trying to understand more about the ecological world. So studies don't always work out the way we think they're going to. And part of this is because of unexpected interventions that actually turn out to be quite interesting. So for example, we conducted an experiment um, in a mesocosm several years ago. And we happened, we were interested in looking at the effect of a pollutant on the zooplankton communities. But the setup of our experiment happened to coincide with the heat wave. And we wondered whether that heat wave had any impact on, on our experimental results. But because we hadn't controlled for it, we couldn't really answer that question. So in the following year, we specifically set up an experiment where we, we recreated a heat wave using um, uh, aquarium heaters <laughs> and, and simulated a four day heat wave so that we could tease apart the effect of the stressor we were interested in, which was increased salinity with the heat wave. And so there are so many ways that students can get involved in research. As an undergrad student, there are often opportunities to work as a summer student helping out in the field. So working closely with graduate students or other researchers. So field courses offer an excellent way for students to get exposure to research. Um, I, the, in the field course that I teach at the Queen's University Biological Station, students have an opportunity to survey a bunch of lakes looking at the water chemistry and the plankton. And then they come up with their own questions that they can go, then go out and test. So they design, they, they come up with a hypothesis, they design the experiment, they execute the experiment, they collect the data, 
they analyze the data and write up a report. So all the components of a scientific study. Students can also conduct their own research through honors thesis projects. So at Queens, students can take a four credit course where they design and execute their studies, write a thesis and defend it um, to their committee. And this is, this is a valuable experience for, for learning how the research process works. The Black Fork Wetlands Environmental Studies Center supports a mission of undergraduate education, outreach, and field research. Its location has a mix of habitats, including buttonbush swamp, swamp forest, marsh, riparian corridor, and upland areas. It's the largest of, of Ashland University's five environmental preserves, 305 acres, which are the ancestral lands of native peoples. Emily Nichols is currently a PhD student of environmental and occupational health in the School of Public Health at University of Pittsburgh. She earned her Bachelor of Science in Biology with honors from Ashland University, which is how she got involved with research at Black Fork Wetlands. She did three years of research on site and appreciates how field research allows her to engage with the environment and see things she might not otherwise notice. You'll be hearing from her today about the differing quality of two wetland plant communities and the possible impact on threatened rails. So my name is Emily Nichols and I used to be an undergraduate researcher here at Ashland University. Uh, my research mostly focused on plant ecology and working with these two marsh habitats. Uh, you can see one of them in the background here right now. At the moment I am actually a graduate student at the University of Pittsburgh and I feel like Having this research experience actually played a major role in deciding what I wanted to do in the future. Especially when I was an undergraduate student, like I never really considered the idea of going into research. Uh, it was the end of my freshman year where I was asked if I was interested in doing this project, looking at plants at some of the marshes here at the Black Fork Wetlands. Uh, and so in my mind, I was just doing it as kind of like a resume builder because, you know, I knew I was going to need it down the line anyway so I was like well I might as well give it a try because I like plants and then I actually got really invested in the project and I found out that you know I actually really enjoy the research process. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at one of these sites. So the reason that we did this project was because at least when it started out it was kind of just this general question of understanding what is at the different sites, what does the habitat structure look like. And part of that is because there's a separate project going on looking at Virginia and Sora rails that live out in these marshes. And we were interested in understanding what the habitat structure is like and how that might affect them. But then it kind of evolved into this project where we noticed that there's this other marsh, which is the one we're at right now, where we have this highly invasive reed canary grass covering so much of it. And we became interested in comparing how those habitat structures differ between this highly invaded marsh and what a native marsh would look like. As I mentioned, the invasive species of interest in our project is this reed canary grass that you can see around us. And when we talk about invasive species, what we mean is a species that isn't native to a certain habitat. Uh, so in this case, reed canary grass is from Asia, for example, and it doesn't naturally occur within North America for the most part. Um, and the reason that's a problem is because in any habitat that you look like, you're going to have different niches where each species has a certain role that it fulfills well. But when you have an invasive species, it breaks all of that and it just does whatever it wants. And that destabilizes the habitat. So this is our other site. And right off the bat, you can just see that it's so much different from the first one we were at. Uh, we call this the rail marsh or the pond marsh, depending on whichever one feels right at the moment, to be honest. This is where a lot of the observations of the Virginia and Sora rails have taken place. Even though it looks dense from a higher up angle, you know, once you look at the ground, for example, you can see that there's actually a lot more openness compared to the thick mats of weed canary grass that we saw at the first site. So 
when we were looking at these habitat structures, the way that we did that was by essentially focusing on a few key variables. So as I already mentioned, we were looking at the number of plants in our sampling square. We also collected samples of certain species to also get biomass values for them. And then another aspect that we actually looked at was the quality of the plants. You know, in any given spot, you can find a wide mix in terms of different things growing around. And each of those different plants is going to be a different level of quality. So some of those plants are going to be very picky about where they grow, and some of them will grow just about anywhere. So here, for example, side by side, we have some burr reed, which is one of the ones that we actually collected biomass for because it's so characteristic of this site. And we also have some cattail as well. So when we did this project, there were a few key findings that we got from the different variables that I described. And the most immediate one that even just from looking around you can notice is that at the boardwalk marsh, there was just such a sheer difference in terms of the amount of plant that was in a given space where the reed canary grass was incredibly dense. Whereas out here we have a lot more going on in terms of how the space is working and the kind of structures that we're seeing. And that also ties into you know, the diversity of the plants themselves. So for example here, because we have all these different species that contributes to the structure of the habitat versus at the reed canary grass site where you only have the reed canary grass. Um, and one of those differences, for example, is that we have these woody species like dogwood just mixed in along with species like burr reed, for example. Uh, so that gives both variety to the structure of the habitat, but it also means that we have variety in terms of the quality of the plants that are growing. At this pond site, we have both very specific and non-specific plants all growing mixed up together, just in general making for a very biodiverse site. Whereas at the boardwalk marsh, we actually did find higher quality plants than we did at this site, but they were very isolated and they were only in that last section where the reed canary grass wasn't growing. I mean, one thing to keep in mind though is that when you're doing any research project, you're going to run into certain problems and especially with field work, things can, as you might guess, get very messy very quickly. Uh, so a site like this, for example, the good news is that because the structure is very biodiverse, we don't have the same density, that also means it's much easier to sink into the mud if you're not careful. So practical challenges like that, such as actually moving through your site. As I mentioned before, actually counting the reed canary grass was a big problem because there was just so much of it compared to what we found at this site. Other problems include things like manpower. So when you have a whole transect, for example, uh, where each of those five areas is 10 meters long, as you can imagine, you want to have a group of people that can be doing that work instead of everything falling to just one person. In our case, we did usually have a team of around three people. But even then, uh, that still meant that there were some practical limitations in terms of how much sampling we could do, when we could go out sampling. You know, you do run into problems like that, but the best strategy is to just adapt to it and do what you can and see what you can learn regardless. So I feel like this project, aside from actually just getting me interested in research in the first place, it actually taught me a lot of skills that are still applicable to the kind of work that I do now. Um, so a big one would just be, for example, data management, where you know, you have all this data, but how do you actually organize it and work with it? You know, what kind of tests can you run on it? Uh, it also teaches you about making figures and actually presenting that data and communicating it in a way that's accessible by a general audience, so that way people know what you're doing. So another thing that really guided me through my current path so far is the fact that working on this project where you have these different habitats that you're looking at, in general, got me much more interested in ecology. It was something that before I really just assumed was like just not very interesting, but then as I actually got involved with doing some of that ecological work myself, it made me much more invested in understanding how these different habitat structures and ecosystems can then affect people as well. Um, so that kind of guided me into looking at urban ecosystems and the projects that I do now where I'm looking at how different factors of urban environments, so air pollution for example, can then affect people.
now it's time for the panel discussion and question and answer session. Um, please post questions for the researchers using the Q&A button rather than the chat. Our college classes have a time constraint of 50 minutes, so we are initially going to have, have to give priority to their questions. After that, we will answer questions from other attendees until the top of the hour. As a reminder, students, please type the word student before your question and make sure your full name is visible. The panelists are going to try and keep their answers to a minute or less so we can get, this, get to as many of these great questions as possible. All right, so to get us all started, I would like to hear from all of the panelists briefly on the same question. So let's start with Ted Grossholtz, then go to Shelley Arnett and finish up with Emily Nichols. Can you tell us or remind us what drew you to field research or freshwater systems or invasive species in the first place? Well, let's see. Uh, I was sort of initially drawn to this just uh, as a, a general problem. In other words, I sort of saw environmental systems being degraded, but wasn't really sure what to do about it. And as I think I mentioned, I had a an undergraduate mentor at Brown University, Dr. Mark Burtness, uh, take me out in the field and sort of show me how to understand ecological systems. So it was really just sort of a lack of my own experience. I just wasn't brought up. I didn't have parents that took me out in the field. I didn't have a lot of natural history experience. So certainly just being able to experience these systems and, under and being shown how to actually learn about them um, from this professor in undergraduate days was really kind of the key for me, so. Yeah, and I, I had some really great experiences um, throughout my career working in the field. And um, one important thing was a field course that I took as an undergrad. And I can still remember a project I did looking at the vertical migration of zooplankton in a lake. And, and I think, you know, that is such a good example of you know, being able to study study phenomena that are like right there, you can see it happening. And I think that's that's such a huge advantage of, of working in the field. And, you know, I, we, I use a lot of a different approaches, but, you know, being able to go into the field and, you know, see it in a realistic kind of natural setting is, was really important. Yeah, I'll just add that absolutely, just a second that there's no substitute for field courses. I mean, you just can't experience that in a, in a lab or sort of a, you know, a classroom setting. So field courses are just irreplaceable. Yeah. And in my experience, I mean, I kind of mentioned this in the video as well, where I fell into it on accident, basically, where, uh, especially as a kid, I was very outdoorsy and I was very interested in going out and seeing the environment, interacting with it. And I realized after the fact that I've always actually been really interested in natural history. And I just never realized that that's what natural history actually was. Um, so actually giving this research a try and seeing what would happen kind of reawoke that in me. And it got me thinking again about all the systems that are around us and how complicated they can be, but also how we can begin to understand them. And uh, as Ted said, there really isn't a replacement for actually going out and seeing all of that for yourself. Okay, hey, um, I think this next question will direct to uh, Ted Grossholtz. It comes from student Karishma Patel. And um, they write, it's very interesting to see that the large body of water is, consists of the small green crab as the predator. Um, is it because the abundance of the species is so large that they are the only top predators in that water? Uh, that's a great question. When I was showing you that, it was the intertidal areas. So obviously, as you get down deeper, there's much larger crabs, much larger fishes, but they live in areas that are they're covered by water the entire time. So this intertidal region, which actually can be in freshwater areas, you can have tidally influenced freshwater zones as we do in Central California, but these areas where the tides go up and down that expose these areas are much more difficult physiologically to live in. And no, there are no native crabs or fishes or really, they're shorebirds, but there aren't really any similar kinds of predators that dig down and take advantage of these species. So great question, but yeah, it is the only species in that 
in that tidal zone, if you will. Shelly Arnett, this next question is for you. Somebody asks, have you identified any changes, physiological or behavioral, in the invasive species due to environmental changes like salinity or water temperature? Oh, that's a great question. And, um, oh, I wish I could um, give you, a, uh, uh, I wish I could say yes. Do you know, though, we have focused more on um, how the native species respond and how that interacts with environmental changes. Um, and so we haven't, we haven't looked at the invasive species itself, but that would be such a great question. And, and especially because what we find in the, in the native taxa is that, that they are quite flexible in terms of how they respond to that, that native predator, whether it's changing where they are in the, in the water column um, to avoid the predator, or you know, um, you know, changing reproductive strategies or whatever. But I think, yeah, looking at at how the the um, the invasive species changes under under different environmental conditions would would definitely be a, a, a great thing to look at. Okay, um, this next question, I think we'll start with Emily Nichols. Um, can you talk more about the opportunities for collaboration you encountered during your project? So in my project, um, it was really nice because uh, there were a lot of different ways that we could actually measure what we were seeing out of the two different habitats. So, you know, as I mentioned, like going out and collecting physical data such as cal and biomass. Um, but there were also a lot of opportunities to go beyond that too. And I think, uh, I mean, as we mentioned, like this is a project where I was focused on the plant side of things, but we also ended up working with these other people who were very interested in the birds and sending the information back and forth to get an idea of the full picture of what was going on out there. So that was really interesting. Um, and I think probably the coolest opportunity was uh, when we actually got to use a drone to survey the site that we were doing our sampling at. Uh, this wasn't really something that, the, that had really been done in my department before. Um, and I had been taking a GIS class and I was getting really interested in mapping. And so we were able to team up with the journalism department with John Scrata and actually essentially like borrow his drone and like survey our site and look at things like patchiness and sample our site that way as well. Um, and that kind of set a precedent for future work using that kind of technology to be done in the future. Um, so you get to meet a whole lot of people and you get to uh, take advantage of opportunities like that and kind of pave the way for future work as well. Gosh, these are great questions and answers. Um, so the next one is for Ted Grossholtz. And there's kind of two questions that are similar. So I'm going to combine them a bit. Um, so one student asks, would the beach ecosystem benefit from a total eradication of green crabs? Or is the ecosystem most benefited from the 30% population cap? And then related, um, do you know why the population went up so much after getting down to 10% and why is that not happening at 30%? Uh, maybe I'll start with that because uh, yeah, so what we found was that adults, we did a lot of experiments to document this, the adults were controlling reproduction. So crustaceans, just like many fishes and a lot of other organisms are cannibalistic, they just eat offspring. And so what we had done is we had actually inadvertently removed control, adult control of recruitment of the next generation. Suddenly we had this huge uh, recruitment event and no adults around to sort of vacuum them up. And so it was, it was basically just enormous survival of the next generation of, of juveniles. So, and we suspect, and there's actually uh, evidence from other systems, including fishes that this can happen. We were just lucky enough to do it experimentally um, and so the idea is, yes, the system would certainly benefit more by getting rid of the green crabs altogether, but as our work showed, that's not a reasonable goal because we'll get this rebound event. And so um, we had all other data to show that this maybe 20, 30% or so is enough to sort of allow some of the native species and some of the other ecosystem functions to recover. So this is the best we can do. In other words, get them down to a low level. Of course, that's difficult to maintain. We talked about using community scientists to help with that, but um, yeah, that's, that's the best that we can do. Yeah, and if I could just interject and, and comment about the eradication issue. And, and I think when dealing with invasive species, you know, you're, you're, the biggest bang for your buck is gonna be dealing with prevention and eradicate, like, 
I don't want to say this too strongly, but eradication is nearly impossible, um, if not impossible. And and I think that's what you know why our in our research we've really tried to focus on. Okay, what can we do to prevent their spread? Yep. Um, you know, once they're there, of course, we we deal with other issues. But I would second that absolutely. Uh, the the best bang for the buck is prevention. Uh, many of us, including myself, have worked on non ship based methods of introduction. So that's really where the management should go. The issue is what happens when they are here. Um, and we published some papers showing that this idea of getting them down to we'll call it and we call it functional eradication to a lower level may be. A reasonable way to approach it, but absolutely, if you have a dollar to spend, try to keep the next gener next species from showing up. Yep. And to add on to that too, like uh, actually removing certain species can just be so difficult in itself. Um, I remember on my own site when I was talking about this research before, someone asked me, "Well, why don't you just go and rip all the reed canary grass out?" Um, and so, even though eradication is ideal in a sense where it's like things would be much better if the invasive wasn't there at all. Um, it can, I mean, as we've seen here, it can actually be really difficult to actually implement. So finding other ways to work around that and get the best that we can for that site uh, with the challenges that we're facing is definitely the best approach, I think. Okay, for students that have to leave now, thank you for joining us. Uh, we will be emailing follow-up information. For other attendees, the panel will stay on through the top of the hour and continue to answer your questions. Um, and I have a follow-up. Um, I'll direct this at Shelley Arnott um, to the, the previous conversation. Um, what role does public outreach play in sharing preventative strategies uh, with respect to introduction of aquatic invasive species? Yeah, I th and I think that that plays a, a key role because um, in the in the systems that that I work in, you know, we think that that uh, boaters are moving a lot of species from from lake to lake, and you know, the the key is really reducing um, the number of of individuals that arrive at at each lake. So so educating the public and getting them to buy into um, methods for decontaminating their boats when they move from lake to lake is 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 so key. I mean, it's it's essential. All right. So I'm not actually sure who this is directed to. So anybody can jump in. Um, a student asks, what would be the best way to get into this specific field research? Are there any current research internships available you know of personally? So if any three of you would like to answer that, please go ahead. Um, in terms of like specific opportunities, I think it really depends on where you're at. But I think especially as an undergraduate student, one of the best things you can do is look at the work that's being done at your institution. So for example, a lot of your professors are probably doing their own research projects. So a really good strategy is to look through what's going on, uh, like go to things like faculty web pages, for example, and see the work being done, and then just reach out and ask them how you might be able to get involved with that. Alternatively, if there is like a certain project that you think of that you're really interested in doing, you can try to find professors that have similar interests to that and see if they would be willing to help you bring that project to life and actually go through with it. Yeah, Emily, you hit on um, really key things and 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 I agree that the kind of at your local university is is definitely a good way to go. Um, I had mentioned in the video um, these uh, thesis projects are possible. Um, and internships and and I know in, in my lab we hire you know like three or four summer students every year and so it's really talking to you know profs and TAs in, in your classes is the way to go. Yeah yeah I, I agree I'll, I'll second that um, during the school year we usually hire undergrads but you know typically they'll have five or ten hours a week so you know they'll have to get involved in fairly limited opportunities, but then, you know, that's often a jumping up point. The ones that seem most interested or most keen, you know, will often hire for sort of similar summer positions, which would be obviously a much greater opportunity. So, you know, get your foot in the door. I think even just sort of putting in a small amount of time will um, to help to sort of facilitate a, a, a larger opportunity later.
All right, I'll jump in with another question. So this one's interesting because it's called freshwater invasions, right? That's what this event is. And yet we have someone who works on the coast. So this question is about how current research has current research revealed how human interactions affect the spread of invasive species of freshwater habitats versus saltwater habitats? Um, well, they're, they're, I, I guess I'm not quite sure the question they're asking. How it do seems they like there's here? a couple things. It's about saltwater versus freshwater and human interactions and how humans are affecting spread of invasive species in both of these habitats. And is there a difference? Well, I mean, I, I guess I'll just jump in. I'm sure Jelly and Emily have some thoughts about this too. Um, many of the ways in which species get moved around are sort of are fairly generic. They're not specific necessarily to freshwater coastal areas. They can be due to fisheries introductions historically, you know, and that can be in either case. Um, there are often, you know, we'll say especially with plants, well, agricultural, aquacultural, backyard water horticultural vectors by which species get introduced. So it, it's, we'll say it's human mediated processes that bring them there. And it's just a matter of people being aware of, of the risk of these different methods. So it's not really very uh, habitat specific. So. Yeah, and another thing um, that I'll, I don't think that Ted mentioned was um, the aquarium trade. Mm -hmm. And and that can move a lot of species around, but you know, well-meaning people, you know, not wanting to, you know, when they're well, I don't know how to say this. When they're finished with their <laughs> with their pets, they they release them rather than doing something else with them, and it's that release can lead to a lot of problems. Yeah, I think regardless of the habitat that you're looking at, in any situation, humans are really amazing at introducing disturbances in a lot of different ways. And any time that you have a major disturbance, that is also an opportunity for invasive to come in and ultimately take over that habitat. So, I mean, as we've all said, it's not really an issue specific to certain habitats over others. Um, if anything, the habitat that you're looking at is just going to constrain which invasives might be able to come in. So uh, things like salinity levels in a saltwater versus a freshwater habitat means that, you know, some invasives might be able to go to one site versus another, but in either situation, there's still that opportunity for something to come in. And that leads right into this other question about what does freshwater mean versus what is salt water? What is brackish water? And as I understand it, these green crabs, Ted, are very diverse. They can, they can exist in diverse salinity ecosystems. So um, do they act differently in a more freshwater system versus near the coast? The, I mean, the adults in particular can occupy a range of salinities. I mean, you know, what the system I was talking about actually was an estuarine system. Um, and beyond green crabs, there are a lot of species, even sort of freshwater aquarium fish that can tolerate like a modest amount of salinity. So one of the issues is that, you know, we think about things being very specific, but a lot of the sort of, in many cases, some brackish water species can actually exist in freshwater and vice versa. So if we're thinking about this from an invasion perspective, we actually wrote a paper showing some quote unquote freshwater aquarium fish can, you know, in, invade low salinity uh, estuaries. It, they, they, they seem to do about the same thing. They may eat different things, they may move differently, but um, they're just our species that are, you know, broadly effective in a, a wide range of salinities and, and perhaps some of the ones that we may have to pay most attention to. So, but we'll let some other folks weigh in, Shelly and Emily. Okay, um, it's time to say thank you to our speakers, uh, Ted Grossholtz, Shelley Arnott, and Emily Nichols. Uh, we also want to thank the Organization of Biological Field Stations and the Center for Environmental Inquiry at Sonoma State University. Learn more about their series of virtual events at thevirtualfield.org and ceisonoma.edu. Thank you to the National Science Foundation for funding this project and to all the wonderful people behind the scenes who made this possible. We will be emailing all of you in the next few days uh, with follow-up answers to the questions we didn't address today, um, a link to a recording of this event, and a link to a very short survey, how you used the event, what you enjoyed, other event themes you might be interested in, and suggestions. 
This is to help us find funding and improve these for the future. We're putting this survey in the chat if you'd like to copy and paste that before we end. We hope to see you at future Live from the Field events currently being planned for 2022. Dates and titles will be posted on both the virtual field and Center for Environmental Inquiries websites by January. These websites are also where you can find recordings of all past events, links to the websites at each field site featured today, and event resources, including publications from each, each, each researcher and educational tools. Please share all of these with fellow instructors, students, friends, and colleagues. Thank you and goodbye from the field. Panelists, please wave goodbye. And thank you to Patty and Carrie.